important, and I keep coming back to that book, because that book by Frederick Engels very clearly explains what socialism is, very clearly explains the difference between utopian socialism and Marxist scientific socialism. Uh, on top of that, it's very short, it's very to the point, but it makes it, it's it's really, really an important text. It is probably one of the most important texts in the history of Marxism. Um, but the reason I took so long to write it um, is because many of you may be aware, and many of you may not be aware, this very important pamphlet, it's very short, it's like less than 100 pages, Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific by Frederick Engels. It's basically a condensed version of this book. Anti During. Many people do not know that, but Engels wrote this book called Anti During. Here, Ugin During's Revolution in Science. Engels wrote this book in 1866, I believe. And this book was a hit. And it was a very, very important text. And so the text was so popular that after a while, they realized that there were many people who needed to learn the concepts from anti during However, they weren't going to dig through it, and many of them had not ever heard of During, so they made a much shorter pamphlet called Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. However, I realized that if I was going to write the introduction to Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific and give a proper context to people who read Frederick Engels' Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific, I would have to go read Anti During. So I did. But I would then have to also go read During because I'd have to know the context. So I went and I go, I went and read During. Not easy to find the writings of Ugin During. And it was reading Engels, reading During looking over some of my own work and my own concepts put forward in city builders and vandals in our age that finally enabled me to piece together this introduction that I wrote to Engels socialism, utopian and scientific. And it enabled me to clarify quite a few things. Who was Ugin during? No one's ever heard of Ugin During. He's an obscure intellectual that has just been kind of forgotten. And it's that's very ironic because at the time that Marx and Engels were alive, Ugin During was very well known and very popular. Ugin During was the Mark, he was the socialist academic of great fame. He was the most well known advocate of socialism in Germany. He was a, an atheist and a religious skeptic. He was a German nationalist, and he was an advocate of socialism. He believed in socialism, and he was going around urging people to adopt socialism. Um, and he was a German nationalist, and his ideas were, were rooted in German nationalism. He thought the German nation state would give birth to socialism. And Frederick Engels and Karl Marx vehemently disagreed with Ugin During and his worldview. And so they wrote this book called Anti During. It was written mainly by Engels with Marx's assistance. They wrote Anti During to refute the writings of, of During and to present their view of socialism as contrary to the view put forward by Ugin During. Now, Ugin During was wildly anti Semitic. He hated Jews. Ugin During was also heavily inspired by Friedrich List, the Roman Catholic economist. Uh, in addition to that, Ugin During, uh, he was the main source of information about socialism for Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche never actually studied Marx. Friedrich Nietzsche only studied During. 
and the critique of socialism that you find in the writings of Nietzsche is actually based on Nietzsche's reaction to the writings of Ugen During. Ugen During was the primary German academic voice in favor of socialism. And when I read During's writings, this anti-Semitic German academic, German nationalist, atheist who was strongly in favor of socialism, when I read Anti-During by Frederick Engels, which is, you know, abbreviated into a shorter pamphlet called Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, I realized something. That there are really three distinct socialist movements. Let me repeat that. There have actually been three distinct socialist movements in history. Three. Not one. Not a thousand. But there are three brands of socialism. And they're influenced by each other. And they pull from each other. But there are really three distinct socialist movements. Now, the first socialist movement, I would say, the, the, the biggest socialist movement, or the earliest socialist movement, may not, maybe not the biggest, but the, the, the first mass socialist movement in history was what you can call scientific socialism or Marxism. The, Mar the socialism of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. And this was the socialism that believes that the working class is struggling against the capitalist class. This is the socialism that believes history is driven forward by conflict, dialectical and historical materialism. This is the socialism that believed that the emerging German nation state of 1848 was the most advanced thing around and that came out of the spring of nations in Europe when working people and other people all throughout Europe were rising up and demanding the creation of the German nation state or, or, or our nation states and democratic republics. And it was this socialism of Marx and Engels that gave birth to the labor movement in Europe. And this socialism was very much socially liberal. It advocated the right of women to vote. It advocated uh, universal male suffrage and eventually universal suffrage for all. Uh, it was very opposed to any remnants of the old feudal order. It was very opposed to the Catholic Church, very opposed to religion and society. And this first socialist movement, this mass socialist movement, brought workers into unions. Factory workers formed unions and made demands on their employers. And it believed that the problems of the capitalist system that Marx and Engels very carefully documented, that Marx wrote about in all four volumes of Capital, the problem of, of overproduction, the problem of the tendency of the falling rate of profit, the, the general law of capitalist accumulation, the problem of production for profit, not for social use, that these four contradictions within capitalism would lead to a situation where poverty continued to pile up on one end of society and great wealth continued to pile up on another, frequent gluts of overproduction, frequent economic breakdowns that would ultimately necessitate the working class majority in the most advanced capitalist countries Britain, France, Germany, the United States, rising up and seizing control of the means of production. And that the factory workers would seize their factories from the capitalists. A government that was organized uh, to express the interests of the working class, the proletariat, the dictatorship of the proletariat would be established. And that this would be the next advance. That just as feudalism had just been overturned by the more advanced system of capitalism in Western Europe, 
in the most advanced capitalist countries that were experiencing these frequent, frequent gluts of overproduction, were experiencing these problems, were still trying to sweep away the remnants of feudalism, that uh, you would have, as a result, uh, you would have a workers' revolution in Western Europe, and that would lead to socialism. And it was the ideas of Marx and Engels that laid the basis for the second international. In Marx's time, you had the first international, the, the, the International Working Men's Association, but it fell apart due to Marx fighting with anarchists like Mikhail Bakunin and others. However, at the time of Marx's death, shortly afterwards, you had the rise of the German Social Democratic Party and the creation of the second international and the second international, the socialist international that came into being in the aftermath of Marx's life was very big and very influential. Karl Kautsky became the prominent leader of German social democracy, French social democracy, Austrian social democracy, the British labor party as the labor movement expanded socialism of the Marxist and scientific variety took off. But as Lenin noted, and many other people noted, the socialism rooted in Marx's understanding of dialectical and historical materialism, rooted in the struggle to destroy feudalism, rooted in the workers' right to form labor unions, this so first socialist movement, this mass socialist movement that swept the world, but really swept the Western world first and laid the basis for the labor movement, eventually turned into its opposite. And Lenin in Russia was the biggest critic of this socialist movement. Because as Western capitalism began expanding around the world, the socialism and the labor unions that had come out of the Marxist socialist scientific tradition more and more became a mechanism for stabilizing Western capitalism. As capitalism started expanding around the world, the higher paid workers that were in craft unions got better wages and they were more loyal to empire. You talk about the aristocracy of labor. The reforms that socialists fought for, socialists were always demanding reforms, public education. Well, the German Kaiser liked public education because all the kids would be in school and they would learn to march in military formation and they would be better soldiers. The German Kaiser said, yep, I like public education. Healthcare. Again, the German Kaiser created a national healthcare system. Socialists fought for it. Socialists organized, demanding the right to health care. The German Kaiser said, yeah, in order to have a more stable German society, we'll create a national health care system. And that more and more, as Western capitalism was expanding across the planet and moving toward the monopoly stage of imperialism, social democracy was a necessary way of stabilizing imperialism and giving them the ability to do it by creating a, a strata of higher paid workers who were loyal to the empire. They never would have had that higher pay if it wasn't for those unions that fought on their behalf. By stabilizing the market, by bringing the government into the economy to stabilize it, by creating a limited welfare state, by, um, by doing all these things, they were stabilizing imperialism by, by creating social democratic and workers' parties that had seats in the government. Working class people were involved in the political process. They felt like they had a stake in helping the German imperialists or the American imperialists or the British imperialists to conquer the world. And that even though Marx and Engels had crafted their socialist movement to be a revolutionary movement of the proletariat, to rise up and overthrow capitalism. By about 1890, Marxism was experiencing the crisis of Marxism because it wasn't happening. Marxism was everywhere. Labor unions were everywhere. But the socialism of Marx and Engels, that scientific socialism that Marx and Engels had developed, which swept away remnants of feudalism, which 
called for the separation of church and state, which empowered women, which, you know, brought in more liberal and modern views about sexuality, which worked very, very hard to empower working class people and bring them into the political process. All of this didn't have the role of creating a revolution, but rather strengthening and solidifying and stabilizing the Western capitalist countries so that they could spread their tentacles across the planet. In a weird way, the socialist movement of Marx and Engels, the original social democratic movement, the second international, it didn't overthrow capitalism. It helped capitalism. If they'd stuck with the old, the old robber baron free market ways, where there was a panic or an economic downturn every two or three years, they wouldn't have been able to do it. But the second international and social democracy, which directly came out of Marx and Engels' work. I mean, the critique of the Goethe program by Karl Marx, that's critiquing the founding document of the German Social Democratic Party, the Goethe program. That the movement that directly came from Marx and Engels ultimately led to stabilizing and strengthening Western capitalism and enabling it to move into its monopoly stage of imperialism. And this is one thing that Vladimir Lenin was very clear about. If you read his essay, Imperialism and the Split in Socialism, he makes this very, very, very clear. The aristocracy of labor, the layer of well-paid workers in the homeland who are loyal to empire. You could not have had World War I without the socialists. The socialists had promised to never support the war, but they sold out their promise. And if they had actually stood firm against the war, it wouldn't have happened. But having cultivating a layer of the socialist movement to be social imperialists who were loyal to empire, bringing the working class into the political process by giving them jobs and giving them education, creating universal male suffrage, this was all part of laying the basis for imperialism. That the, the, the scientific socialist movement that started with Marx and Engels turned into something they never meant for it to turn into it turned into a mechanism for stabilizing Western capitalism. And it led ultimately into in 1890 and up until 1910. And then finally in 1914, when World War I broke out, it led to what they call the crisis of Marxism because it was doing the exact opposite of what it had intended to do. It had intended to make a revolution, to overturn the rule of profits, to create a socialist society, and instead, it had made the rule of profits more stable. It had made the Western countries more, more solid. And it had enabled the capitalism of Western Europe to stretch its tentacles all across the planet. It had enabled the corporations and banks based in Western countries to become super monopolies, to super exploit and make super profits across the planet. That was very much... And that was very much the result of that original socialist movement. That's not what Marx and Engels meant for it to be. But that's what it became. And the anger that flows through Lenin's writings, and we'll get to that later, the anger that flows through Lenin's writings is Lenin saying, the socialist movement, the second international is a stinking corpse. And he's realizing but this is the result. This is, this is Marxism and the writings of Marx and the teachings of Marx and the Second International taken to its logical conclusion. And Lenin is a break with this time of socialism. Lenin said, we don't want to form a mass party that anyone can join. We want to form a party of new type. Lenin said, we're not fighting against capitalism. We're fighting against capitalism in its monopoly stage, imperialism. And Lenin said that nationalism among oppressed nations, among people in, in countries that are dominated by Western capitalism is a good thing. And Leninism is an update and an adjustment of Marxism, realizing that Marxism in and of itself had not led to what it was intended to lead to. 
Leninism breaks with Marx. It updates Marx. It supports national liberation struggles. It talks about imperialism, capitalism, and its monopoly stage. It has a theory of building a party of new type, a vanguard organization. Lenin, Lenin's, Lenin's Marxism, Bolshevism, was a separate movement. And the European Social Democrats knew that. Karl Kautsky attacked Lenin, called Lenin a dictator, accused Lenin of engaging in red terror. And Lenin wrote a book attacking Karl Kautsky called Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky. The Bolsheviks knew that their Marxism was not European social democracy. It wasn't the movement that Engels and Marx started, even though they claimed its heritage, even though they drew heavily from it, they were doing something different. And the European Social Democrats, the British Labour Party, uh, the, the, the Social Democrats of Europe, the German Social Democrats, the French Social Democrats, they knew that Bolshevism and what Marx and, and, and Engels had started and, and what Lenin was doing over there in Russia was a completely different thing. There was a clear understanding, a clear understanding that there was a break. And that's important. So that first socialist movement, the socialist movement of Marx and Engels, you could argue that it's still alive because most of Europe is dominated by social democracy. It's gotten more and more reformist, less and less revolutionary as time has gone on. The British Labour Party, are they revolutionary? No. Do they want to, do they want the working class to seize control of the means of production? No. They just want to manage capitalism more efficiently. The German Social Democrats, the French Socialist Party of Francois Hollande. This is not this is not a revolutionary movement. But if you look at the IMF and the World Bank, you look at the United Nations and the people that staff its various institutions, you know, there is a vaguely socialist feeling that they have, right? On New Year's Eve in Times Square, they sing Imagine by John Lennon. AOC is a member of Congress in the United States. Bernie Sanders is a member of the U.S. Senate. This socialism, this socialism in a lot of ways is just a mechanism. This social democracy is a mechanism that the richest of the rich use to try and stabilize capitalism. And the people who fight it are the lower-level capitalists. It's the factory owners. It's the lower-level capitalists, the nouveau riche, the newly rich, the new money. They're the ones who fight against it because they don't want to be regulated. And they want a total free market so they can compete. And they know that the ultra-rich are the ones that will get the government contracts. They know the game is rigged in favor of them. And that it's it's the ultra rich, it's the Bill Gateses of the world, it's the uh, it's the you know it's the the Rockefellers, it's the World Economic Forum. Those are the folks that like social democracy. Tony Blair, and it's the lower level capitalists. Your Betsy DeVos's, your Donald Trumps, your Nigel Farage's. They're the ones that want total free markets. They're the ones that don't like the social democracy, the welfare state. They don't like it because they feel that it is a mechanism for restricting their ability to grow and res restricting their ability to make profits. And they, they see that the ultra rich are using it to stabilize society. They don't want society to be stable. They just want to make a lot of money. So that's the first socialist movement the socialism of Marx and Engels that gave birth to European social democracy. And it did not create a non-capitalist society. It did not overturn capitalism. It strengthened capitalism. Now, the second socialist movement, we can trace, in a way, to Ugin During. Not really. There's no direct lineage for this second type of socialism. And this second type of socialism, or anti-capitalism, this is what you call the right-wing anti-capitalism. It's the belief that the problem with capitalism is that it's not enforcing morality and that we can regiment society and kind of author with, with authoritarian methods, we can get out, we can beat out the, the instability of capitalism 
and solve the problems of capitalism with heavy-handed state activities. While the first socialism emphasizes class struggle, the workers against the bosses, this socialism emphasizes all of society is one and everyone knows their place and everyone is obedient. Ugin During, he hated Jews. He loved the German nation state. And later you have, uh, what's his name? Oswald Spangler. And you have Ernst Junker and Prussian socialism. And these are right-wing anti-capitalist movements. And they argue generally that unlike Marx and Engels that see socialism as, as part of a historical trajectory, we go from hunter-gatherer civilization to feudalism to capitalism to socialism, they don't see it that way. Rather, they argue that humanity, mankind, has two drives within its soul. On the one side, it has the drive to make money and to be individualist and to be successful. And on the other side, it has loyalty to one's tribe, loyalty to one's nation, loyalty to one's community or religion and obedience. And that this individualism is capitalism, this individualism, this greed, this entrepreneurialism is capitalism, this loyalty to the nation, loyalty to religion, loyalty to the family. This is socialism. And that there's a constant push and pull in all human civilizations, right? And that, that you have to find the right balance. Uh, and, that, and that the problem they argued in Europe was that, uh, was that they had just gotten too far, too far in the capitalism direction and that they needed to get back in the socialism direction. But in their minds, Marxism was the antithesis of that because Marxism talked about struggle, workers against the bosses, fighting for the rights of women, fighting against monarchies. And they argued that no, socialism is about authority. Socialism is about obedience. Socialism is about tradition and religion, et cetera. You read the writings of right-wing anti-capitalist voices, which were very prominent in the 1920s and 30s. And eventually you had the rise of the Nazi state in Germany, Italian fascism. And, and you know, Oswald Spangler uh, and Ernst Junker and Martin Heidegger and these forces, these forces had a completely different conception of socialism and a completely different conception of capitalism. Capitalism was bad because everyone wasn't being obedient, but they wanted an ideal society where everyone knew their place, where everyone obeyed. They admired the caste system in India because everyone was born into their caste. They admired the, the Tibetan feudal kingdoms. Julius Evola. Do folks know the name Julius Evola? Julius Evola, Evola was an Italian, an Italian fascist. Um, he was made famous by the Italian fascist government. But he was critical of Italian fascism for not being conservative enough. He wrote Man Among Ruins and Ride the Tiger and, and Revolt Against the Modern World. He was a traditionalist philosopher. And if you read Julius Evola's fascist ideology, which, I mean, it was the fa Italian fascist state that made Julius Evola famous. I mean, if you read what he's writing about, he argues that there is what he calls the organic state, the ideal way of being. And he talks about the solar system, and how, you know, the stars, uh, you know, the, the stars all revolve around in the Milky Way. And in within the galaxy, uh, you know, you have the, you know, the solar system with, you know, the, uh, the, the, the sun at the center and people revolving around it. And that's the ideal state of being. But there's this ideal way of doing things, this ideal society where everyone knows their place. Everyone is obedient. People are, are, are doing their best to follow the rules and please the leader. And that there's this ideal way that we have gotten away from. And that, that, you know, he talks about basically he's, he's, he's talking about how every, every major religion, every, every myth mythology has an ideal, like a, like a perfect, an origin story, like the garden of Eden, but then something happened and we got away from it. But if we're authoritarian enough, and if we're traditional enough, and if we're obedient enough, we can get back to that ideal where everyone knows exactly what they're supposed to do and, and everything is perfectly in orbit, just like, this, like the planets revolving around the sun. That's, that's what he's arguing. And Julius Evola, in his book, Man Among Ruins, he talks about what he calls the demonic nature of the economy. This is very interesting. And it sounds a lot like what we hear from the synthetic left. 
but he talks about this story. It's a legend. It's not, not true. He's not citing an event that actually happened, but this, this story that is commonly told, and I've heard it before. Many people have heard it before. Who knows if it's even true, right? I mean, it could be something somebody made up. I've heard Buddhists say it. I've read it in Julius Zavola's writings. Who knows if this even ever happened? Supposedly this happened. Is that there was a, a, a capitalist a British or American or a Western capitalist who set up shop in an Asian country like China or India or, or some Asian country, he set up shop. And the story goes that he opened his factory and the, the employees were working at his factory. And he realized that his employees could work harder than they had worked before. And so he had the idea to double the pay of his employees. He said, you know what? I'm going to double the pay of all of my employees. So he doubled the pay of all of his employees. And then the story goes again, who knows if this is even true. I mean, it could have happened, I suppose, but it sounds like it's made up to me. He doubled the pay of all of his employees. The story goes, and then all of his employees gathered and they said, we're only available half the hours we used to work. And the point of that story is supposed to be that in Asia, people are happy with what they have. They're not caught up in this desire to have more, this desire to grow, and that this drive for historical progress, this, this desire to want more than you already have, this is a Western distortion. And that's so beautiful, beautiful, that these beautiful Asian people from, from beautiful primitive lands that are close to this ideal, they didn't want more than they already had. And they, and, and Julius Evola writes about this. It's beautiful to see in that, that he writes that in the West, we have the demonic nature of the economy. Everyone wants more. Everyone wants to create more. We want more products. We want more things. And this is demonic and satanic. And it's so beautiful that in Asia, people are like that. Well, first of all, I have a feeling that people in Asia would like to have more than they already have. Look at the history of China over the last, you know, 50 years. That's a story of growth. I have especially the conditions people were working in and living in. You know, you go back a couple hundred years. I, I think the whole story is malarkey. It's made up. It's made up. Um, but it serves this idea. That's the critique, the right wing anti capitalist critique of capitalism. They want everyone to just be born into their place, to know what they have, you know, and it's and and they're idealizing ancient civilizations. They talk about Rome was great when it was rigid and authoritarian, and then Rome got soft and they were too nice to people and they weren't executing people enough and they weren't cruel enough, so Rome fell apart. And that this is right wing anti capitalism, and this is what laid the basis for the Nazis, right? Um, however, to be fair, the Nazis broke with this, right? Uh, uh, you know, and many people have pointed out that, that the Nazis, while they drew heavily from Ernst Junker, while they drew heavily from Martin Heidegger and other people like that, from Oswald Spangler and others, they weren't really pro following it because these guys were opposed to any mass movement. They were opposed to any mass movement of any kind. The idea of the broad masses of people getting into motion and rallying, they didn't like that. And the Nazis, in order to take power, created a mass movement, right? They had big rallies. They rallied society against the Jews. They rallied society. And that was opposed. These guys did not believe in populism of any kind. They believed in authority and obedience. They didn't believe in democracy. And they openly said it. You read Ernst Junker. You read Oswald Spengler. They were against democracy. Why? because the leaders shouldn't be trying to get the approval of the people, they argue. No, the people should be wanting the approval of the leader. The leader, the king, is the father of the country, and the people should be trying to make the king proud of them. They shouldn't be voting for the king, right? Just like children don't vote for their father. No, there should be a, there should be a strong leader at the center that everyone's trying to please. This is their kind of argument. You read right-wing anti-capitalism, which does exist. It's a, I mean, it existed. The Nazis drew heavily from it, but even they couldn't be loyal to it, or they'd never been able to take power. In order to take power, they had to, um, they had to, you know, they had to build a mass movement. And these kind of philosophy, this kind of thinking, is against mass movements, right? And it's right-wing anti-capitalism. This is During. During was a right-wing anti-capitalist. His anti-capitalism was rooted in 
was rooted in German nationalism, rooted in anti-Semitism, rooted in traditionalism. Even though he was an atheist, even though he was very critical uh, of, of society, it was it was very much an appeal to authority, um, you know, and, you know, you know, Friedrich List was not anti-Semitic, right? But it drew from Friedrich List. Friedrich List and the notion of the government being the powerful institution that balances the harmony of interests, that kind of controls the economy, it rejects free trade, et cetera. This, this second form of socialism, this right-wing socialism, it also did not create a non-capitalist society. Germany under Hitler was very capitalist. You know, they, there was production organized for profit. There was a lot of military spending. There was a lot of political heavy-handed repression, but it was still production for profit. In, in Mussolini's Italy, they talked about the corporate state where they'd have the private corporation and the capitalist who owned it and a leader of the fascist party and then a representative of the fascist labor union that all the workers had to join. And it was a corporate. So the, the government and the corporation and the, the, the labor union would team up in order to make the economy function well. Well, at the end of the day, the profits are all still going to the capitalists. So it's still production organized for profit. And the same for Spain, uh, Franco in Spain, he called himself a national syndicalist. Well, syndicalism we know is the labor movement. It's the idea of the workers owning the factories. Um, however, did the workers own the factories in Franco, Spain? No, they did not. No, they did not. There was some kind of government body where the fascist government official sat down with a representative of the workers organized into a fascist union and a representative of the company and acted as a mediator or something, but it was still production organized for profit and the factory owners still got the profits. It was still capitalism in Franco, Spain, but it was dressed up in this we have a great leader who does it for the good of the nation and blah, 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 blah. It was dressed up in anti-capitalist sounding rhetoric. But at the end of the day, it was still capitalism. And the same for Nazi Germany. Hollemer shocked the, the Krupps and the Tysons were making billions of dollars. They created, they created a state-controlled company called, um, called Volkswagen. But the owners of Volkswagen, the investors, made millions and millions of dollars, and they got free labor from concentration camp inmates. The government facilitated it and supplied it with concentration camp labor, and and you know enabled them to have a semi-state monopoly. And they, you know, but it was still a private company in which lots of capitalists were making a lot of money. They still sold those cars in order to make a profit from them. Nazi Germany never abolished capitalism, and neither did Italian uh, Italian fascism, and neither, neither have any of these right-wing anti-capitalist societies. Um, and right-wing anti-capitalism, it had its ascendancy in the 1920s and 30s, and after that, it kind of died. You know, it was it was you know once you had a booming economy in the West, all the people advocating advocating right-wing anti-capitalism in the West kind of deteriorated back into advocating advocating free market capitalism. Uh, you know, there, there were some exceptions, right? I mean, in a lot of European countries, they do have like an old hard right, you know, that, that, that has, uh, has some vaguely anti-capitalist beliefs. The British National Party, the BNP, I think if you read their constitution, they advocate some kind of worker cooperative scheme or something. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, right-wing anti-capitalism, uh, you know, has never created a non-capitalist society. And what it has created has been rigid authoritarian states designed to stabilize capitalism in a time of crisis. Now, social democracy in Western Europe has stabilized capitalism in kind of a long-term way. Right-wing anti-capitalism tends to lead to war. Right. Uh, the, you know, the the Nazi government, uh, they they created an economic boom when they first came in with dramatic economic moves. And then by about 1937, 1938, they had to go to war because their economy was on the brink of collapse. You can only spend so much money on on armaments and weapons and stabilize the economy that way for so long. Uh, you know, Italian fascism ended up having, you know, in 1935, they, they, they colonized Ethiopia. They were, they were expanding and seizing territory because if you, if your economy is centered around the government spending huge amounts of money on weaponry, after a while, you start to have a problem. And that's a problem that we have in the United States. It's called the military industrial complex. You could argue that 
that Nazism in Germany was the first military industrial complex and the first prison industrial complex uh, implemented very, very rapidly. They, they stabilized the German economy with a military industrial complex and a prison industrial complex implemented very dramatically and swiftly when the Nazis took power. They put a bunch of the country in prison camps. They put a bunch of the country in military uniforms. They started up the spending uh, on, on the military and they, they created a, an authoritarian capitalist state. There's only one socialist movement that has ever created a non-capitalist society. And it's actually created a number of non-capitalist societies. And that is the third socialist movement. And we ought to think of it in that term, even though Lenin did not think of it in these terms, even though, uh, you know, even though, um, even though the, the Bolsheviks and the Soviet Union thought of themselves as just a continuation of Marx and Engels, we can recognize that they weren't. Marx and Engels thought the revolution would happen in Germany and in the Western capitalist countries. It happened in the third world. They had a new formula for building a political party, a party of new type, which was completely different than the mass democratic parties that the Western European social Democrats had. They, they supported nationalism of the oppressed countries. That Lenin himself was a break with European Marxism. But Stalin was an even further break. Read the debates between Stalin and Trotsky. The theory of permanent revolution versus socialism in one country. And when it really gets down to it, what did Stalin and Trotsky disagree about? Trotsky was holding on to European social democracy and Stalin was doing a full-on break with it. Trotsky believed that unless you had a communist revolution in the Western capitalist countries, there was no hope. That the socialism of the third world, you know, should just be a temporary holdout to spread communism to the Western countries. And furthermore, Trotsky saw socialism as about struggle and confrontation and bloodlust. Whereas Stalin, as the Soviet Union starts building socialism in one country, as the Soviet Union has five-year economic plans, suddenly... The Soviet Union is giving people a very different vibe, even though they espouse dialectical materialism, even though they believe that history comes through struggle, even though they believe these things. The Soviet Union doesn't strike people that way. Go and read Anna Louise Strong. Go and read Edgar Snow. Go and read, uh, you know, what they write about China in the 19, 1950s and 60s. It doesn't give people that kind of vibe. It's not a society all about struggle and confrontation and, and vengeance and punishment and tear it down. It's not that kind of vibe at all. In fact, go to Cuba today. It gives people a vibe of oneness, not struggle, not confrontation, but oneness. People coming together, people working together for a common good and unleashing growth in the process. The Soviet Union was all about mobilizing the population to build. The country was coming together and they were building. It's not the socialism of Evola. It's not the socialism of, it's not right-wing socialism because the right-wing socialists don't believe in growth. They don't believe in empowering people. They believe in reinforcing social hierarchies, reinforcing patriot. It's not that. It's about empowering women. It's about empowering the peasantry. It's about empowering the working class. And it also isn't the socialism of Ugin During and the socialism of these folks, because it's all about growth. They want things to grow. They want things to expand. However, it's not necessarily the socialism of Marx and Engels either, because it's not emphasizing struggle, and it's not em emphasizing confrontation, and it's not emphasizing tear it down and burn it down. And in fact, it gives people this oddly religious vibe. It gives people this, this glowing feeling of community, this feeling of oneness that Sigmund Freud writes about in his book, in his book um, Civilization and Its Discontents. This, this, this feeling of being part of something bigger than yourself, of working together, and, and it, it has a different vibe. It's not the struggle, tear it down vibe of, of Marx and Engels and dialectical materialism, and it's not the the authoritarian traditional hierarchy obedience drive of of the of the right wing anti capitalists and the fascists. It's a totally different vibe. And what Stalin did with the five year plans when he built 
Russia into a modern industrial country that was, you know, outdoing the world, building the world's largest power plants, the world's largest steel mills. It's completely different. And Trotsky hates it because it's not permanent revolution. It's not bloodshed. It's not chaos. It's not focused on an all out struggle to destroy the European societies. It's not that. Trotsky hates it. And Trotsky, Trotsky is putting out a barricade socialism about workers' militias and, and confrontation. And Stalin, instead, he's starting to talk about a popular front, uniting, uniting the different forces of society to defeat fascism and focusing on anti-racism and universal human values, what we all have in common, how we all want society to advance. And, and in some ways, even though the working class is central, you know, that, that, you know, the critique that, that Trotsky writes and he's writing, he says, he says, what happened to the workers and the bosses, right? It's now socialism that we hear from Stalin, that we hear from the communist international is about, you know, the people's mass movement for justice. It's about, it's about, you know, uniting society. Yeah. They explain how the problem is rooted in capitalism. Yeah. They explain how the working class is the most important class, but it's not about, you know, inciting society against each other and clashing. It's instead about, about doing what is in the interest of all and having the working class at the center of a, of a united struggle on behalf of all people in all society, the universal good of mankind. And as socialism progresses following the Second World War, the People's Republic of China comes into existence. The people's democracies of, of, of Eastern Europe emerge. And you start to have eventually Baathist Arab socialism and the socialism of the Arab people. And you eventually get African socialism, Julius Nyerere and Kwame Nkrumah. And eventually you have Gaddafi and his Islamic socialism. And you get, you know, you get all these different variations of what is really a distinct movement. And this third type of socialism, that is the only type of socialism that's ever created a non-capitalist society, is this type of socialism. This third form of socialism. And this type of socialism is not really about struggle and destruction. Yes, it demands justice. Yes, it, it's against, you know, against the rich and powerful and especially against the imperialists. But it's more about appealing to the good in people rather than the rage and the destructiveness of people. On top of that, this socialism, while it's not inciting people against each other, it's not rigid and authoritarian either. It's about empowering people. It's about bringing people into the democratic process. It's not about conservatism. It's not about trying to restore the past. It's not about trying to bring back the Indian caste system or make people obedient. It's not about the military and hierarchical control. This third type of socialism that we have seen that, that began as what you could call Marxism-Leninism with Stalin and then expanded into what we have now with Bolivarian socialism in Latin America, with socialism with Chinese characteristics that exists in China, uh, and Deng Xiaoping theory that exists. You know, you can talk about the Juche ideology on the Korean Peninsula. You can talk about Baathism. You can talk about the Islamic Revolution of Iran. You, I mean, there are many different incarnations of this, but this third type of socialism that traces its heritage in many cases back to Marx and Engels, but really began with a very big dramatic break, a very big dramatic break with European social democracy. I mean, it was a fundamental break. What the Bolsheviks were doing was completely different than what was being done by the European social Democrats. And they both knew it. The social Democrats of Europe, they said, Lenin, you're running a cult. That's what you're running. You're running a crazy monastic order, religious cult. You know, we want we want uh, we want a society that is, uh, you know, we, we want a debating society. You know, you're running this rigid authoritarian group, you know, and Lenin, you support nationalism. We don't support nationalism, nationalism. We want, you know, all workers are one. We can't support any nation. Right. And Lenin, you're talking about the problem is imperialism. It's the, 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 the Western capitalism. It's spreading its tentacles all over the planet. We don't talk that way. We, we are against capitalism. We're against all, you know, the factory owner exploiting the factory worker. But you're talking about this huge system where, where, where big corporations in the West, you know, dominate the world and hold back development. We don't talk that way. Bolshevism was a different brand. It drew heavily from Marx and Engels, but it was a different brand. But it wasn't. It wasn't right-wing socialism by any means. 
You know, I mean, I'm sorry, it was not those women in China who emerged with unbound feet. That was not right wing socialism. Those peasants in Russia who, you know, who were empowered and were having peasant associations and communities uh, and, and assemblies and were being brought in and women, women who hadn't even been allowed to get education under the old system who were becoming electrical engineers and such. This is this is this is a completely different thing. It's a completely different thing. And it's in a way, it's the golden medium. Because it seems to, interestingly, have taken the best, the best of what we call the left and the right. From the left, it's taken the understanding that the means of production must be controlled for the good of the people, that the, the people come first, the broad masses of people should be empowered and brought into government. That's good. It's also from the right, taken community values, loyalty to the family, loyalty to the country, community service, you know, you know, loyalty, community obligation, responsibility. You know, these are all things that are valued by the right. Whereas it seems like the left in the Western world is a disgusting hodgepodge of the worst elements of both right wing socialism and left wing socialism. They believe in struggle. Oh, yeah, they believe in struggle. Conflict. Burn it down. Tear it down. Hate religion. Hate the family. Hate society. Burn it down. Tear it down. And they take from the right. They don't believe in growth, right? The demonic nature of the economy. And they want a very authoritarian society where anyone who has a thought crime is punished for it and everyone knows their place and no one criticizes anybody. So, so in a weird way, the socialism that's developed around the world has taken the good parts of the political left and right and merge them into a model that unleashes growth and brings people together and solidifies communities and empowers whole countries to rise up. And the Western synthetic left, which is becoming the ruling ideology, mind you, wokeism is the new religion of Western society. Forget about Christianity. Forget about the American way of life. That's all ancient history. Wokeism is the new state religion brought to you by Bill Gates, brought to you by the World Economic Forum. Wokeism is the new state religion. And wokeism, wokeism is both, both negative sides. It's all about destruction. It's all about instability. It's all about chaos. It's against economic growth. It believes in heavy-handed state authoritarianism. It wants a highly controlled capitalism. They've taken the worst of both worlds. And the wokeness the new, the new socialism, if you want to call it that, that's, that's defining the West, doesn't oppose production for profit. It just wants a worker cooperative scheme, just like they had in Mussolini, Mussolini's Italy with the, with the corporate state, just like Franco did with his, with his uh, what did he call it, his national syndicalism, right? They, they want production organized for profit. Oh, we must have production organized for profit. Can't have central planning. That's fascist, they insist. Can't have what the Soviet Union or Cuba or Venezuela has. No, no, no. They, they have to have production organized for profit. But we're going to bring the workers in in this weird national syndicalism cooperative scheme. They don't believe in economic growth. They want to drive down the population. People have too much. That Their critique of capitalism is growth. They take that from the right-wing anti-capitalists. But they also really like this notion of, 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 you know, of, of struggle, conflict, tearing down existing institutions, ripping people away from having any loyalty to their country, their community, their religion, their family, anything. They want everyone ripped asunder. They want to tear things down. It is the worst of both worlds. So in a weird way, what we have rising around the world is, is the most effective form of socialism, this third form of socialism, the only type of socialism that's ever worked. The socialism that made China what it is today, the socialism that defeated the Nazis, the socialism that, that raised Libya up into a modern country and built the world's, you know, the world's greatest, uh, you know, biggest irrigation system, the great man-made river, the socialism that made Cuba what it is today, the socialism that's doing wonders in Nicaragua, that, that socialism, that third socialism is rising around the world and it has taken what's best, what's best from the socialist movements of the past, and it's created a, a, a model that works. And then in the West, as capitalism is dying, dying Western capitalism, as it's becoming more and more unstable, has pulled 
pulled from right-wing anti-capitalism and pulled from the tradition of social democracy and the left and created this gross, destructive form of fascism called wokeness that is a hodgepodge of the worst elements of the first two socialisms. This is fascinating to me. This is where we're at in the world today. The political model coming out of the West, degrowth, wokeism, anti uh anti-populism, authoritarianism, wokeism, the model that's coming out of, out of the East, which is cooperative economics, central planning, communities and societies coming together, populism. This, these, these are the two systems that are clashing. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. This is the world we live in, and you can frame it in, in three socialist movements. And so that's what I wrote in my introduction to Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific by Frederick Engels. And then from there, I pointed out that, that what Engels defines socialism as in the third chapter of Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific, what Engels defines socialism as is clearly what they have around the world. A society with production upon a predetermined plan, a society where the means of production are operated according to the benefit of society, um, a society where profits are no longer in command and the anarchy of production, the chaos of the market has been abolished. What Engels wanted, what Marx and Engels wanted has been brought into being. And it came into being not in the Western capitalist countries as they believed it would come into being, but rather in the East. And it came in not as the most advanced capitalist countries finally working out the contradictions of capitalism, but rather as a mechanism for countries that were kept in chronic poverty by the domination of Western capitalism and imperialism became a mechanism for them stabilizing themselves and rising up. It's all very interesting. This is how the world has developed. And this is how politics has developed along with it. Politics is largely an expression of existing social forces. That's something that we understand. We understand as Marxists, right? That there is an underlying economic base. That these ideas don't just come out of nowhere. They represent different social forces contending for power. And that the working class movement, the working class movement in Western Europe which was what Marxism originated as the political expression of, became hijacked by the ultra-rich that wanted to stabilize it. And that later, the, as the factory owners and the industrialists and the militarists in the West were fearing some kind of, you know, some kind of collapse amid the economic crisis of the 1920s and 30s, we saw the industrialists and the militarists, you know, try to bring into being a right-wing anti-capitalism, fascism, as a mechanism for stabilizing their system. But ultimately, socialism emerged as an expression of entire countries that have been kept chronically poor by Western capitalism, where the working class was the essential class in mobilizing society to break free from the dominance of Western imperialism. That's why on the Chinese flag, what do those stars stand for? We have the the big star, and that's for the Communist Party. But those other stars, they represent the block of four classes because it was the whole Chinese nation that was liberated by the Communist Party with its proletarian ideology. But there was a block of four different classes that, that strove you know, to, to carry it out under the leadership of the Communist Party. The, the proletariat, the peasantry, the middle peasantry, and the national capitalists, all of them led by the Communist Party with its proletarian ideology to lift the country up from poverty. Right? This is, this is the era that we're living in. And with this understanding, you can kind of understand where we're at. And that the reason that the Center for Political Innovation, the reason that what we put out on here is so important and so unique is because we understand this. And really, the Center for Political Innovation is the only expression of this form of socialism in U.S. political discourse. Now, there are other forces that, that I'm friendly with that, that, that appeal to it, right? The LaRouche people, they have their own views, you know, but they kind of get this. They don't make the links I just made, but they get it, right? They understand that there is a new world, you know, there's a new economic system that's emerging. Russia and China are part of it. You know, they get that. They understand that. 
you know, um, and that they have their views centered around Lyndon LaRouche and, and, you know, energy flux density. They have their own views, which are not my views, but they, they get this. Right. And I think, you know, there are other forces in the country that get this as well. But the Center for Political Innovation, we put it into words. We have the analysis. We can explain what's going on. All the other Marxists and leftists still think they're doing the Marx and Engels thing. And most of them completely disavow and denounce and want nothing to do with the socialism that exists around the world today. And instead, they embrace the destructive wokeness that has taken hold and become the new ruling ideology of Western civilization. And not only that, they help the wokeness enforce itself. They go around attacking whoever wokeness is targeting. Most of the Western left has completely surrendered to become a wing of wokeness. You have a few outliers, you know, socialist alternative. And, uh, you know, you have a few outliers that hold on to hold on to dogmatic socialism. Some of the Trotskyite groups, they're still trying to be the socialism of Marx and Engels. They're still, you know, but but they're not. They don't get it. They're behind. There is a socialism that exists in the world today, and it ain't the wokeness of the Western capitalist countries. It's the socialism of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's the Eurasian Economic Union. It's the Islamic Revolution of Iran. It's Bolivarianism and, and the Bolivarian alternative of Latin America. It's, you know, it's Baathist Arab socialism in the Middle East. That's the socialism that exists in the world today. Right? That is the socialism. That has emerged. You talk about Juche on the Korean Peninsula, Juche ideology and Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-un, right? This is real socialism and this real socialism is different. And CPI is an attempt to try and figure out how this third type of socialism could be applied in the United States. How could we bring city building socialism to America? How could we do it? How could it be done? How could we have a socialist movement in America that was an expression of this third type of socialism? As Western capitalism is, is decaying and falling apart, as the imperialist centers are coming apart at the seams, how can we bring this third type of socialism, the city-building tendency, how can we bring it to America? That's, our, that's what the Center for Political Innovation intends to do. And that's why we talk about the city building tendency, city builders and vandals. That's why we talk about all these things. That's why some of the way we talk doesn't sound classically Marxist. We study the hell out of Marx and Engels. You know, we quote Marx and Engels extensively, but we also study Roosevelt. We also study John Brown. We also study American progressive movements and traditions. And on top of that, we study Baathism. We study the Islamic Revolution of Iran. We study Bolivarianism. Right. We study Deng Xiaoping theory. We study Xi Jinping. This is what makes us unique is that we are an expression of the real socialist movement that exists in the world today. And we have the political sophistication to recognize it. There are anti revisionist parties in the world today, and they're 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 the best parties, the parties that exist today that support North Korea, that support China, that support Cuba support Venezuela, the parties that have Marxist Leninist at the end of their name. And those, those are great groups. Those are the best of the best of all the communist groups. The anti-revisionists are the best because they still believe in it. And, you know, but at the same time, we have blazed new trail. We are blazing new trail because we, we continue to hold on to anti-imperialism. We continue to uphold the experience of Stalin and Mao and socialism in the 20th century, but we understand what made it work and how it was different. And we understand why China is working today. We understand why the anti-imperialist countries are working today. We get it. We get it. We have something that's very, very unique and special. We are, we are the American incarnation of the socialism the socialism that exists in the world today. And this is very, very important. This is very, very important. And in order to be that, we have to understand the history of Marxism, Leninism. We have to understand the history of, of the Communist Party, the history of the Communist International. We have to understand all of this. This is all very, very important. Um, but this is where we're at. This is where we're at politically. And so I thought I would just explain that point about the three forms of socialism. Um, and that's the introduction, basically, to my new, uh, my our new edition of Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific, which should be completed uh, pretty soon. We're trying to figure out how to finish the publication process. This is all very exciting.